If you notice the last highlighted words in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the Spirit gives life. We've been talking about the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he's made us, or at least Paul, <clears throat> but I would say that this is true for all of us, those who are ministers or those who are able to serve with regard to a new kind of covenant. And that new covenant is, based, is not based on law. It's based on the ministry of the Spirit. Uh, and that ministry of the Spirit, one of the things that happens in this new covenant is he joins us to Christ, which we have already looked at. So that we've seen in 1 John 5 that um, if you have the Son, in verse, this is 5.11, if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. So we have, the Holy, we have God the Son in us, and that's how we have life. What does that look like? We saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, at the end of this, in verse 18, verse 17, it says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So the Spirit's producing freedom, not slavery back to law, which is what he's talking about in the verses right before this. And then we all with an unveiled face, I always have to put it in context, in the preceding verses where he's talking about the law, he says that Moses put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel could not see that, that the glory of the law would fade. It was not a permanent thing. It was temporary, and it would fade. And it, so it had a fading glory. But we, with unveiled faces, we don't put a veil like, Abraham, like Moses did. We're reflecting the glory of the Lord, and we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another degree of glory, which is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So the Spirit is actually producing increasing glory rather than fading glory. And Pastor Tim Holsher, and in this ministry, we want to see that there is some activities that reflect this glory. What does that mean when we talk about reflecting glory? Well, there's certain activities that that is going to be more obvious. It's going to be visible. And yesterday, we looked in 1 Timothy chapter 6, where he is talking to those who are rich in the world, and he tells them to be rich in good works. Rich in good works. That's the thing to focus on, not <clears throat> the acquisition of things down here. So he says there are some people that are rich in the age, but he says those that are rich in the age need to stop focusing and putting their trust on that wealth. That wealth can all be gone tomorrow. We may think it can't. We may think that we are uh, inflation-proof. We may think that we are failure-proof. But the reality is people the world over know what it's like to have everything and then have nothing. And so he says, don't put your trust in that. What you ought to be focusing on is being rich in good works. And when you're doing that, what you're really doing is you're using eternal life. And we saw yesterday that he had told Timothy in 12 to lay hold of eternal life. And then we can remind ourselves here, take hold of that which is life indeed, or some of your older translations have that which is real life, instead of indeed that which is real life. In other words, that's the real life. We think that things of the world are real life, but Paul says this is real life. And I want to go over to 1 John chapter 3, and uh, these statements in 1 John chapter 3 where this book, and if you remember um, back uh, several days ago, we looked at the fact that Jesus Christ manifested this life. And that's what the first part of this book says in the opening verses. He manifested this life. And now he is developing a case for the fact that one of the things we do with this life, it's not the totality, but one of the chief things we do is that we live out love. Yeah, we live out love for other believers. And so then, interestingly enough, verse 13 says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. And he tells them that because he says the world didn't know God, so it doesn't know us. And so, yeah, the world hates us. And that word hatred isn't, uh, missio is not hostile hatred. There's other terms for that in the Greek. Uh, missio is, is kind of the hatred that's like, eh, if something bad happens to you, I really don't care. And if you need help, I really don't care. That's that kind of hatred. It's just kind of a total disregard uh, for you as an individual. He says, and we know then. 
And he doesn't use the experiential knowledge word here. He uses the word oida. He says that you know, as a, know this as a fact. You know this as a fact that we have passed out of death into life. Now, th he's talking here about eternal life. He's talking about moving out of the sphere of spiritual death and moving into the realm of spiritual life. Remember, the Holy Spirit's the one that causes that. He's the one that joined us to the Son. He took the divine nature and he knit some of that nature to us so that God shares a little bit of his life with us as human beings. Doesn't make us God, doesn't make us even little gods. It's simply him sharing with us some of his character and in this case, some of his life. And this is specifically God the Son being knit to us in this particular instance. And we saw that last week in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. So we have passed out of the sphere of death into the sphere of life, that we now have eternal life. And he says the reason that we have this intuitive knowledge then is because we love the brethren. Now the reason he uses intuitive knowledge here, he says it's not it's it's not something experiential that if you have this kind of love that you go, oh, I, I know this is life. No, what he says is there's an intuitive knowledge you have to have that love is a demonstration of this kind of life, the kind of life that God the Son had, because he's the one, as he's going to tell us in a little bit, that demonstrates that love by laying down his life. So we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers, you know, other believers. He who does not love abides, or he's still at ease in the realm of death. Verse 15, everyone who hates this missio, disregards, doesn't really care for his brother. And we're going to see an example in the context here. His brother is a murderer. And that word murder is, is a manslayer, literally. It's not a person that violently is trying to kill a person. It's because you don't care about them. Yeah, their life is, is um, you just let it go. Okay. And he says, so a brother, is, that person is a manslayer. And you know that a manslayer does not have eternal life abiding in him. Now, abiding, we've been over this word. It means it's not at ease in him. You may possess eternal life, but there's a difference between possessing it and it abiding, it being at ease in you. We know love. And now he switches to experiential knowledge. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, I'm going to point something out here that I don't know that everybody appreciates, but if you went back over to John chapter 13, and Jesus gives a command to love like I have loved you, he is talking about the act of serving other believers by getting down and washing their feet. That's what he had done. That was his act of love that he had been demonstrating to those disciples, and that is the precedent. We always think that this is dying. And so we think, well, yeah, I could die for you if that's what God wants. But that's not what verse 16 is really telling us, is that we ought to die for a brother. He says we lay down our life. We lay down that which is most dear to us, that which is most precious. We, we set those things aside. Now here's where it's going to come out. Whoever then has this, the world's goods, and the word, the word for goods is, is by us. So it's the things of the world that pertain to this biological life. Now, I, this is my estimation, estimate. The things that you need for this life is you need food and you need adequate clothing, adequate protection from the elements. Those are the two things you really need. You need food and you need adequate clothing. So he says, if you have this stuff of the world, and you see, and this word see means you see well. It's not you glance, you kind of think it's there. No, this is you see it well. You can clearly recognize it, clearly identify that his brother has a need. And he shuts up his, and some of your Bibles are going to have the heart here, but literally it's your gut feeling. And I think most of you, unless you're really a tough person, you know what that gut feeling is like when you see a person suffering or going through something and you feel this down in here going, oh, man, you just feel for them and it just almost makes you feel ill, but you shut that up. You won't allow yourself to feel for them. Then how does the love of God abide in him? It's how's, how, how can you say God's love is at ease in the individual that can close up his, the way he feels, the compassion that he feels for a brother that has a need? No, 
Keep this in mind. This is how he says, this is the way you're laying down your life. And this is also how you're hating a brother. You're hating a brother by cl shutting up your compassion, the, this feeling, this intense inner feeling that you have. That's the way you do it. But by, by the same token, or on the other side, the flip side of that, it would be loving them. If you did love them and you did meet their need, that would be the way you're laying down your life because you're taking what you have set aside for yourself, what you're saving, what you've worked for, and you're using it for somebody else. So he says in verse 18, little children, do not let us love with word or tongue. It's easy. It's cheap to say, I love you. But he says, you need to do it in deed or work and in truth. Now, I believe the reason he says in truth is because if you kind of learn what that love looks like, you look up here in the context and you see, well, you've got the things of this world and you help a brother with a need. That's what I'm supposed to do. I don't want the other Christians to think that I don't love people, so I'm going to do it. But it's not really what I want to do with my money, but I'm going to do it so that I look good. Then that's not truth. It's not genuine. You're going through the motions of that kind of activity. You're going through the motions of that kind of love, but it's not genuine love. You see what Paul's saying, or what John is saying here? And the purpose of looking at this, the reason I bring you over here and remind us of this, is because this is how you know this kind of love. This is how you know you've passed out of death into life, because love, love for your brother, is one of the chief ways that you are going to lay hold of and demonstrate eternal life. We saw over there at the end of Ephesians 6 that you also demonstrate love by doing good. And doing good and love can oftentimes go hand in hand. But this is the way you do it. And I'm going to venture to say, every one of you listening to this, probably in the next 24 hours, is going to have the opportunity to set aside something that is important for you in some way and love somebody else. And the reason I say that is because I think that this is happening to us every day. Every day this happens to us as believers, that we have these opportunities to love other people by laying down our lives, by setting aside what is most important for us and doing something for them. And it's not always going to be meeting some material need that they have, but it may be giving our time to them for a while. There's a variety of different things. But all of that, all of that to say, is that if you have eternal life, you can lay hold of eternal life. You can use eternal life. And when you're doing that, you're functioning in the life that the Spirit has produced by knitting you to Christ. And in so doing, as you exercise that in love, it encourages you, it helps you to recognize what God's doing and have a good day in the Lord. Thank you for joining me today.